Welcome to this special bonus chapter of the Steel Driving Man, John Henry, The Untold Story of an American Legend audiobook. I'm Panama Jackson, narrator of the audiobook and columnist and culture commentator. The novel recounts the true story of the man behind the iconic American hero, John Henry, the mighty railroad man who could blast through rock faster than a steam drill. Today, we're delving into the enduring fascination and presence of the John Henry archetype in pop culture. The Ballad of John Henry is the most reproduced folk song of all time. And like the ballad, the character John Henry looms large in our culture, coming up in various forms of entertainment, literature, and art time and time again. One notable manifestation is found in the DC Comics universe with the superhero John Henry Irons, known by the alter ego, Steel. The image of John Henry was even used for a postage stamp in 1996. These instances represent just a small glimpse into the myriad references to John Henry across different forms of American culture and media. So today we're excited to have the creators behind the 2020 film John Henry with us. Joining us are Will Forbes, the director and co-writer, and Douglas Skinner, co-writer of the film starring Terry Crews and Ludacris. One of the most streamed movies of 2020 on Netflix, the film follows John Henry, an ex-gang member from Los Angeles, in his hero's journey to help two immigrant children who were on the run from his former gang. Additionally, Will's most recent film, Name of the Game, won the Audience Award for Best Documentary at the 2023 Mammoth Lakes Film Festival, so you should be sure to go check that out. Doug is the co-founder of EBE Productions and co-writer and producer of the film. And last but not least, we are also joined by Scott Reynolds Nelson, author of Still Driving Man, John Henry, The Untold Story of the American Legend. Scott is an award-winning author and historian specializing in African-American history, railroad history, and the history of commodities. He's taught at William & Mary and the University of Leiden, and has been a research fellow at the EHESS in Paris, Harvard's Warren Center, and at the Newberry Library in Chicago. A Guggenheim Fellow in 2019 and 2020, he now teaches history at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. He also has a new book out, Oceans of Grain, How American Wheat Remade the World. So glad to have you all here. Um, I'm excited to have this conversation about like John Henry and pop culture. You know, uh, Will and Doug, you all have made a film called John Henry, which depict has Terry Crews and Ludacris in it. But, um, you know, like Terry Crews plays a man named John Henry, um, who interestingly is kind of like the stereotypical visage of like how we think of John Henry in pop culture. Like, you know. I don't know exactly how tall John Henry's supposed to be in your movie, but sometimes he looks like he was seven feet tall. You know, I know Ludacris ain't that tall, so when he's standing there like that, that, that wide, you know, screen oh. towards the end, <laughs> it looked a little closer in height. But, you know, it's interesting because in reading Scott's book um, and doing the audio book and reading, you know, it turns out that, you know, John Henry is like a 5'1 light-skinned black dude from New Jersey. So it's like the the version that we think about John Henry and pop culture versus how like maybe historically what he was are two entirely different things. So that's one of the things I want to get into. But Scott, I want to ask you a question about that, because as a historian, as a, a person who's written about this and then seen all these other depictions, like what's the like <clears throat> what's the craziest depiction you've seen of John Henry in like pop culture? But based on what you know to be. The true, the, the true story of, of John Henry. Uh, right. I, I think it would be John Henry Irons, the Marvel character, mm. who ta- they take John Henry and make him a kind of uh, sort of uh, low-tech um, Iron Man, right? So somebody, but somebody who can design the uh, outfit for himself, and, but he represents that same struggle. Uh, against the machine, but he's he's somebody who who controls machines, who makes machines. So mm-hmm. I thought that was uh, fascinating. I think too, the Communist Party had a vision of John Henry that's that is impossibly strong, right? So in the 1920s and 1930s, before Superman comes along, that version of John Henry, it's like he's a balloon smuggler, you know, like like the big <laughs> balloons for for arms, like impossible mm-hmm. figure, uh, and so. The, those are the two that uh, stick out to me as the kind of impossible John Henry, this big muscle bound character, and then somebody who uh, uses technology all the time. So it's crazy to think of like that John Henry made it to China, 
but uh, understandably understanding like what the image of John Henry is as like a communist party symbol also makes sense to me. Um, especially uh-huh. the more that I've looked into it, you know, I, I grew up with a certain image and idea of John Henry and like Will and Doug, I, I want to ask y'all about that. Like before you made this film, but in general, like what was your, like, Will, let's start with you. What was your like enduring idea of who John Henry was before you even got into the filmmaking? Was it, were you familiar with John Henry? I know some people, I grew up with the idea of John Henry. I know some people, uh, I, sp- I spoke to somebody from West Virginia who was like, man, John Henry is just a part of our culture in West Virginia. Like we grow up with John Henry from 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 being babies. So what were you all's like idea of John Henry before you even got into the filmmaking process, which I'm assuming involved research and all this stuff? Yeah, yeah. For, for me, um, you know, it, it was ingrained in like I, I knew about it early on, like it was in taught in school, you know, along with the other other tall tales, you know, the Paul Bunyan and all that kind of stuff. Uh, my dad is a history teacher, so I think that might have might have helped in a right. little bit on that. Um, but I grew up in upstate New York in the country. So it's like I was in a town of 400 people, um, you know, pretty much everybody's white. But it was never, you know, it was taught the same way it was taught as anything else was taught. So it wasn't it wasn't really missing from my education um, where I like where I talk to other people. It's like it seems like it is missing from other people's educations. So I don't know if that's specific to, you know, where I grew up or the, you know, the town I was. But um, but, yeah, I, def- I definitely knew about it from from a young age what about you doug oh so same here uh when i was in school we learned about i, I come from the age you know i grew up in i was born in 76 so uh, i grew up where it was hooked on phonics you know and, and then the little the little books that came with like a record you know so you listen to the record and you read the book at the same time right um uh, so i saw so i knew about john henry but getting back to scott it's not Marvel, it's DC. I'm a huge comic book fan. Oh, so <laughs> oh my God. he was oh in my DC. God. He was in DC, not Marvel. Yeah, the so, super. I know you're talking about fan, Superman. So. We got We got to get it right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Let's get. Let's get it right. That's let's sad. Right. That's sad. That's sad. And I recently, I've been, I've been I recently out of just comics seen, too long. <laughs> I recently seen a, like a another like a cartoon version to uh with like, Superman had died and he was taking up the mantle, you know, oh, in that right, aspect, right. which is coincidental. To this pocket, to what we're talking about today, but definitely <laughs> learned about it in school. And my depiction of him, like I was kind of curious when I had read the the doc, and it was like he was five one, right? And I'm just like, oh, because everything I've ever seen, he's been like this huge, dark skinned black dude with muscles, bald head. Just you know, it gives off that he's strong, you know. So that I definitely, I, I wish they practiced that more in school, but they they don't. Like Casey goes to bat, you know all that kind of stuff that kind of put all that in the same in the same realm you know it's funny you mentioned superman uh we might as well get into it here so i remember i was what 13 or 14 years old when the when superman died when the whole doomsday series and dc i had all right, the, it was right, like four right, different right. supermans that came out of it uh i had each one of the right, comic books. right i'm pretty sure i still have my steel comic book and i don't know if because i was a little black kid i like gravitated towards that one in general but I also kind of knew the story of John Henry. Uh, At least I'd heard it. I don't know how much I knew about it, but I do remember the Superman comic being the place where it really, like it became a part of like my memory, like a core memory of, Mm -hmm. of like John Henry was there. So, you know, and maybe, maybe, you know, Scott, you can speak to this. Like what is John Henry's influence on Superman? Is there, I mean, John Henry definitely predates Superman. So, um, (laughs) you know, is there some research to suggest that? Yeah, so part part of what I try to uh, talk about in the book is that the story of um, Superman and and Captain America, right? They they emerge right around the same time: Superman, nineteen thirty eight; Captain America, thirty nine or forty. And both of them are the influences for them are, I think, the Steel Driving Man. So so if you look in popular culture before Superman exists, before nineteen thirty eight, uh, from say thirty three to thirty seven. What you see is, at least in uh, Cleveland and in New York City, uh, the images of powerful black men who represent the Communist Party. So, so the Communist Party, you know, is it's based in the Soviet Union. It's supported in part by, by the Soviet Union, but um, there's a U.S. Communist Party. It's very small, but the place that it exists is in Cleveland or New York, and a, and a couple of other places, Birmingham, Alabama, and there are all these images of John Henry. Uh, steel driving man who represents the worker. And uh, in 1938, when, when uh, Superman comes along, 
he is it goes from being the steel driving man to the man of steel and mm. uh he, he wears a suit but he does the same thing that the communist party superman does hmm. which is to sort of rescue workers so if you look at the first uh dozen issues of action comics that superman is rescuing workers from corrupt bosses breaking into mines to uh defend uh workers and things like that it's only when the u.s enters the war that we start to see the patriotic kind of captain america and uh superman uh, characters emerge but to, to my mind both uh siegel and schuster who built uh superman and then uh jack kirby who drew uh, captain america shortly after that uh the image that they had in their mind was this powerful strong man who represented uh the america and the american working class and that's what the symbol the, the symbol for the america and the american working class for the communist party anyways from 30 to 30, 33 to 38 is john henry uh so i i think that there's a pretty good case to be made that John Henry is in fact part of the, um, you know, the communist strongman is, is one of the kind of frames for uh, initially doing this. After 45, after the, you know, U.S. and Soviet Union split, um, they're no longer allies. Then both Jack Kirby and Siegel and Schuster uh, ch change uh, Captain America and Superman to make him more of an anti-communist character, make him more of an anti a, a symbol of kind of white, uh, you know, stand up masculinity or something like that. And so he gets less and less uh, like the old uh, crusader on behalf of the working class that we're used to. If you look at the very, very old comics, that's that's uh, my take on it. As you can imagine, there were a lot of uh, uh, fans of Superman that were very unhappy about the idea of a black man being the model for a hundred percent where some of i was going to major... go with that a hundred percent the direction i was going to go i got go. death threats i got death threats yeah i got death threats the, shortly after the book came out it's like he was not a black man you cannot say the superman was a black man there is absolutely no way i know where you live so oh. <laughs> listen people was ready to fight about possibly recasting like black panther <laughs> So, you know, like Ariel as uh, right, Halle right. Bailey as Ariel <laughs> and the Little Mermaid was about to start world well, a new civil war. So I am not surprised that people hold very tight to their ideals of iconic, especially like the like the perennial Captain America or Superman type thing. Like those are like the American fixtures and one I don't know if you all know this, but we have a bit of a race problem in this country, and I imagine it's. <laughs> I love to say it's gotten a, little, a lot better, but I, guess I didn't I notice. Don't. I didn't notice. I didn't notice. <laughs> Look, me and Will, we're sitting right here. We never, we never notice it. Right, right, right. right. People go. confuse us as being twin brothers all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let you know as we're talking about like enduring images and pop culture, Superman, all the but. So you all made a film called John Henry. So let's let's kind of get into the film and and talk about. Let's talk about it. So what, like, Will, what inspired you to, what was the inspiration for this John Henry film? Like, why did you make the film? Yeah, so. Um, and why John Henry? It really came from, yeah, so it, like the, this, the specifics of why John Henry is like, um, I was listening to the Harry Belafonte song, you know, and, and I was, at that time, I was very into, um, and still am, but like, I was very influenced by 70s and 80s grindhouse films. Um and westerns like those are the two kind of archetypes that i was trying to put together in this movie <laughs> specifically like fred williamson stuff like like vigilante black cobra original mm -hmm. gangsters stuff from like 80s 90s kind of on the back end of black exploitation right. where a lot of those guys like specifically fred kind of took the the you know the um the infrastructure that was there from those movies and started doing it himself rather than giving it to all the white people that were that were making those movies before um you know, so I, there's a there's a griminess and, to those those early kind of things, and then with the westerns, it's just, there's similar characters that that are that you find in those movies, which is, you know, stoicism, you know, stoic men who are like lived a hard life, they have a story, trying to get over that life, and just <laughs> have, keep getting have a story, and they just keep getting pulled back into it. You know, there's a there's this movie, a couple of movies that were the most specific kind of um, things I was story wise that I was looking at it was like Valdez is coming which with Burt Lancaster, where he's just like, he's there, he's with some uh, cops in the old West and they, they disrespect this woman and he just wants to get her paid. And then they just ruin his life and leave him for dead. And he just was like, no, I'm going to get that money for that woman. You know, that's all, it's all I really want to do. I'm going to help this woman because she needs help. 
and I'm strong enough to do it. Um, and so movies like that, where it's like, you know, so I saw a parallel when I was, I was kind of listening to the song one day, um, and just kind of thinking and just hearing the lyrics is like a, a man with a hammer kind of coming back and, you know, kind of fighting there. And I was just kind of putting those two things together and trying to think of a way to, to put that into modern times, you know, to, to cr create that character, create that kind of grindhouse feel of one of those movies, you know, especially the, the 70s grindhouse, there's a lot of similar things going on with crime that we see today, you know, with the, with the crack epidemic and things like that, where it's like people having to police themselves, you know, when the law doesn't, isn't there to help you. Um, and what comes from that, the good and the bad, you know, it's like people are going to, are going to do put, take things into their own hands and then violence begets violence. And then th that becomes a cycle. And how are you going to break that cycle? And when it came to John Henry, the theme of, you know, man versus machine, what if that machine is the cycle of gang violence, you know, and he, that's what he's trying to fight against rather than oh. trying to fight against, uh, the, like the machine of capitalism or something like that, which is still the same kind of thing in this, in this, in this way, cause that's, what's really keeping them down in the first place. But but yeah, that was that was the original insp inspiration that came from it. It was like trying to take on, you know, a couple different genres, mash them together and, and then create a new legend out of it um, where we're trying to create a world where because it's like, like you said, his name is John Henry, but he's not specifically the John Henry from the story. I was initially trying to create a world where that story didn't exist. And he was the first John Henry that created the legend for a new generation. You know, so if they're like he like so it's hundred years from now, kids are talking about this specific John Henry. And that's the, like in, in, like in the hood and things like that. It's like that he inspired some, like that same kind of thing that the original John Henry inspired in the 1800s. So I, I could definitely see the black exploitation and the grindhouse uh, in mm -hmm. that piece, but I, w I was really struck by the stoicism, which, which was uh, distinctive, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the super quiet. And I thought about this thing called John Henry syndrome. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a big, a, a undiagnosed hypertension is one of the biggest killers of black men uh, even today. And uh, John Henry syndrome is that ex is that story about how people keep things bottled up inside mm -hmm. and rather than uh, expressing it and rather than going to a doctor to, ch to check about hypertension, that you see these really high death rates for black men. And, I, and that's what struck me when I saw the thing was was thinking about that kind of uh, reinterpretation of the legend of John Henry it was uh, amazing. Did, did, did that at all influence you or is that not something? Yeah, like it's it's really trauma response, you know, um, the idea of you know, like gun violence and how it affects people, you know, because um, it's there, there's so much stoicism. And it's like Doug can speak to this, too, is a lot of these, you know, a, a lot of this gang stuff came from, you know, poker stories, stuff, stuff I had heard around, you know, from just kind of being in this world. Um, and what you don't hear is like it's it, in light, you have to kind of read between the lines is the trauma response of those things like a good mutual friend of ours um many years ago was shot and he's like the biggest kind of like happiest dude in the world and the, what, the way doug describes it is like when he was in the hospital it's like five of the hardest dudes in the world's crying together you know and that's something that you that's the side you don't see in these types of movies is like what the actual and how that affects people in the rest of their lives, how that's going to affect people when they get into different situations, how, what the, how, what, where they're putting those feelings. Cause they're not putting it out there. They're not going to therapy. They're not going to like places where, and they don't have the kind of support system from family that, that they might have that to be able to talk that stuff out. Um, where does that go? You know, and that goes deeper and deeper inside. And with John, um, you know, he buries that stuff from his childhood and it's just kind of, and it takes, and he's like, even in, there's a, there's a section in the movie where there's a home invasion going on and his inaction is the issue. It's what causes his right. father to, you know, to get killed and everything. And, you know, that's a trauma response is it not knowing what to do when something, ha you know, he sees it he's like this gun could help me, but I can't use it. Cause it's, you know, all of those things are, or it's like, it's not necessarily sexy, but it's the kind of, it's something that I was trying to explore. Yeah. So just kind of piggyback off of what we were saying, um, like he was talking about uh, my friend who had a shot. He's actually in the movie. He's the, the big guy, the biggest guy in the beginning of the in movie. In the beginning, playing cards, um, like the guy playing cards. And all the playing cards, yeah. right, yeah. Yeah, he, he actually got shot. He got shot five times. He actually still has a bullet in him, and his weight is what saved him, right? So we're all in the hospital, and these are some – and most of the people that were in the hospital were in the movie. You know, these are all real gangsters. These are all we, we filmed in real hoods. You know, we want to make it authentic as possible. But that is a common issue that we all have because they can't show weakness in the hood like that. We don't go around chit chatting about 
personal problems. This always has to be a problem, still has to be filtered as like, is this a problem that's hard enough that can be discussed? We can't discuss financial problems and emotional problems and things like that because you'll be looked on looked upon as being weak. So I this is that's the direction that we well, went. Let know? me hop in here too. I mean, and I'm this is this is gonna be for you, Doug, because we're two black dudes, right? I mean, this is not even a hood issue. This is a black man problem, right? Like you're you're talking about the the state of the right. black man in, in America, right? Like we don't vulnerability is frowned upon for us, right? Like the idea of look, I'm I, I live in Washington DC. I'm a working man. I am um multiple degrees all the all that all the markers of success but i still technically live in the mm-hmm. poor i live in the poorest ward in dc right so i've made it and i'm still in this space where i still got to put on a front when i go certain places because nobody wants to be viewed as weak and it right. frustrates me all the time so i'm like why am mm-hmm. i doing this but there's also this issue of right. i don't even belong here like i'm not supposed to be here but this is where mm-hmm. i am so i still have to i still have to wear the mask on occasion right mm-hmm. and you know, this kind of speaks to right. the idea of John Henry as this part, like what we're talking about. John Henry's like pushing through despite it. Like, you know, how does the idea of John Henry, like it, it plays on stereotypes, even, like he's with still like a, I'm trying to figure out the exact question I'm trying to ask, because this is really like a, like a, when I had this conversation about John Henry, I was really like, this just sounds like being black in America. Like, all, like the story of John Henry is being black in America. You fight, you fight, you fight, and the system kills you in the end anyway, right? It doesn't even, it doesn't even matter how, it doesn't matter how successful you are. You got to work twice as hard to get half as far. You're still just a black man. And even in this right. one, in the in your movie, John Henry, you know, gets kills hell, and then you think he has a heart attack and dies in the process, which seemed like an, a nod to like the John Henry story. So I guess it's like, you know, just from your own vantage point, like what, how does John Henry, like in, in, in your case, if it does like fight against these stereotypes or like what, what is the representation of John Henry in your film supposed to be for like, as a black man looking at this, you know what I mean? Well, so I look at it, like you just said, like it is a, a black man issue, right? But the pro- also the same problem is it's within our family as well, because him and hell are cousins. Right. But he's looking at him as weak because he got out of the game, you know, that he wanted to better himself. And I'm in the same position. I have multiple degrees. You know, I have a regular nine to five. You know what I mean? But and I live in the hood. You know, it's just I should my own paper. If any other race, I would be successful. Right. But that that's definitely not the case. But um, even in, within our families, we have that. We still have to be strong. We still have to look strong. Don't look weak. Don't look vulnerable because that's just not the depiction that we want of you, you know. So with John Henry, I see him taking care of his dad. You know, he's helping out the little, helping out the girl. In any other case, he was supposed to give her right back to hell, but he's like, let me do try to do something different. And even he gets blackmailed, you know, bring her back. He's still standing his ground. So I look at it as that as a success, you know, like I, I could easily get back into this life, you know. No problem, but I'm choosing to go this way. I have to have my mind made up. I have to go this way. And I don't want to live that life. I want to keep looking over my shoulder. I just want to live a normal life. So even at the end when you think he's dead and he goes to the mailbox, um, you we kind of leave a mystery. Is he going to get with the lady friend and kind of just right. move on, get a new dog? You know, just <laughs> even in the beginning when his dog dies, you know, he's showing vulnerability you know he's actually crying you know and the guy's like you so big why are you crying you know kind of give him some slack but uh i think that's just what we just have to overcome this take out the stereotype take out how other people view us in that we're human too no matter how big or how small we still go through stuff and we have to deal with it in a better way instead of demeaning each other saying oh you weak just power through it what does power through it mean yeah. you know how i'm gonna power through this you it's know how do idea. i overcome it if I have to keep dealing with it and never speak on it or never actually deal with it, you know, just going to compile until you, I call it, I call it the Bruce Banner effect. Okay. Bruce is calm, <laughs> but when you make him angry, all hell breaks loose and it's difficult to get him all the way back down like a slow burn. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, so that's, that, that's, that's how, how I kind of look at that's it. That's black masculinity. So I guess to that, to that end, I mean, I think a lot of, you know, what the representation of, of John Henry, both in your film and like in pop culture is very much like, you know, it's a double edged sword because the, the vision that people expect out of black men, especially they look at like you look at 
I mean, sure, John Henry looks a certain way, but it's like as a black man, you're supposed to step up beyond all. Like you just you're never supposed to have mm. there's no vulnerability. There's none of that stuff is supposed to be there. But I do appreciate the storytelling where it's like, listen, I got a story. I'm trying to make changes. I'm trying to be somebody different. Y'all don't want me to be somebody different out here. <laughs> like y'all want me to die from this nonsense, <laughs> but I'm trying to right. push through. Um, you know, and I, I got I just got to ask. I just got to ask. Is the dead dog a nod to John Wick? Like, is this, you know, like John Wick, the whole thing. <laughs> this man got his dog got killed. Yeah, and he went I'm on a little bit. I'll take it. I had to ask. I had to it, ask. It, it, a little bit. It was, it was, on, it was honestly just like a studio note. Like, we, they needed like a scene in the beginning that like set some stuff off. And like, I, yeah, I think it was coming off of John Wick. I was like, yeah, we'll that. <laughs> I found out very quickly people really hate when you kill dogs. They're not yes. a fan. Uh, and when you, when, you, when you kill dogs in the movies, the whole website about that stuff. Um, yeah, I needed something so like the one of the things about the movie is like we had a very, 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 very low budget. Like it's like it was the we got a lot of big names in it off of the strength of the script. Um, and the fact that there aren't a lot of movies for all black cast. Like it's the big thing we found we when it went out there to actors we because is under a million dollars. Well under a million dollars wow. what we made it for. We only got to shoot about half of the script. Um, because we had so such little time. And then when we got all these big names attached, the budget got even smaller, smaller, smaller. So um, it was meant to be just a small independent film. Like, like I said, it was mostly cast with my friends. Um, and we're going to have like maybe one or two people that, that could help out. But the script got out um, to the town and like every black actor that was that was a name wanted to be a part of it just because there was, you know, it was well written. And there was some um, and it, like like I said, it's a for a strong script for an all black cast where it's not about racism. You know, that's not what the movie is specifically about, whereas there's a lot of. <laughs> especially right now, um, I feel like a lot of pressure on black filmmakers to make their films about racism for white people, you know, to make them feel better about, you know, the situation or try to educate them and stuff like that, rather than just making it for a black audience for them to be entertained. Um, so the, when it came to that, like we, when we were casting, yeah, we, um, and I, I always saw Terry as, you know, a great representation of what we were trying to say, because he is that anti-stereotype, you know, like he's, big muscle strong guy but underneath that he's a sensitive artist you know very quiet has very different opinions about you know race than a lot Everything. of people you know gotten to step a in a lot controversial of controversial on occasion you know but <laughs> yeah but but to that end that i see it as a good thing because that like you uh, know in, in the world we're trying to live the the breadth of opinion and like ha being able to disagree and being able to have you know, people of different races that have different opinions about even themselves, that's progress. That's what we're trying to get to. And those contradictions within himself, I think were helpful to the character. It took him a little while to kind of figure it out, but I feel like he, like towards the end of the of the, of the the shoot, he was really, you know, he started to, started to really become the character and understand that stoicism. And and I think also having uh, Ken Faree, who's, you know, one of the greatest people in the world, uh, play his dad, who in a perfect version of this movie, you know, we, we would have done it in 1992 with Ken playing John Henry. I think it's like, that's the, the version of it that I think is Ken is like a good six inches taller than Terry, you know, is that kind he of guy. Like a huge um, human. I know. definitely can say, I mean, he was sitting he's, down. Oh, is that why he was sitting down all like, is that why part of the reason yeah, why he's yeah. sitting down all the time? Or, he was, he was yeah, uh, injured. So we had him in a wheelchair. Does, Cause yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we had him in a wheelchair for that. Cause it's like just to take his power. There's a, there's a movie, uh, a Fred Williamson movie from the 70s called Hammer, um, where he plays a boxer. Yep. And I, I saw this as like a spiritual sequel. And BJ is BJ Hammer is the movie. So like we're, I'm kind of making a version where John Henry's father is BJ Hammer. You know, it's like loosely oh. Oh. the version of what I'm Hence trying to do. His here. legendary um, uh, sexual prowess, uh, <laughs> which he exactly. There were some, <laughs> some very entertaining <laughs> monologues about what <laughs> about his prowess in L.A. Exactly, exactly. So, um, and I so the, when I come back to Ken, so what I saw with Terry, both with Ken and with Baju, who played his, his grandmother, um, when I put the two them together, when you could see him at, in, interacting with you know an older black actor that that's that could be kind of a parental figure to him, he completely changed, and it was you could tell he was drawing on some very real and personal stuff, um, and you could see kind of like see stuff kind of coming out of him that wasn't there before. And him kind of working through his own stuff. So I think the, all, all of that stuff really helped, you know, um, create some realism and, and the stuff we were trying to do as far as like, uh, the, like show the, the different, like the change of stereotypes and, and things like that. Yeah. Scott, when you see movies like John Henry, this, like, how does that comport with what you, your research and all the information that you've taken in about John Henry? How does it comport with kind of like the, 
the view in the myth of John Henry as he is in American pop culture and folklore and all that stuff now? Uh, it's I, I love it. I mean, I'm not one of those people who thinks, uh, you know, th this is not uh, th that he's an untouchable character. I mean, because the real person is is so complicated, right? He dies at a very young age, at, at the age of 21. Uh, I think he stood out to other people in Richmond because he was one of the few people in Richmond, one of the few black men in Richmond who had not been born a slave. So he spoke differently to other people and people admired him, not necessarily because of his strength, although he probably was quite strong. Uh, you had to be a strong person to, to work in those uh, tunnels. But uh, that's, that's the beauty of John Henry is that he doesn't belong to anyone. He doesn't even belong to John Henry. He doesn't even belong to the man who lived and died at the age of 22, along with 200 other men at the Virginia penitentiary um, that, you know, he, he hammered through uh, a mountain that connected the South to the rest of the world. And it's, and his story when he rewrote the history of the South was to rewrite the history of the world. And so uh, I think that uh, uh, these, all these new interpretations of him uh, are fascinating. As, as somebody who also does folklore, I was struck by the black exploitation part of it because I've, I've always, when I grew up, I grew up in Sanford, Florida, celery capital of the world. I was actually from <laughs> upstate New York, but, uh, and Sanford, Florida was a mostly black town when I was there. Uh, and we had one uh, motion picture place, which was called the Ritz. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was all black exploitation films and all black audience. Uh, so we would go, um, we were the, my brother and I were the only visibly white people who would go to the, those movie theaters. We watched those black exploitation films. And so I didn't really see white people on a big screen until I was like 17 uh, or something like that. All the films that I saw in Sanford were those black exploitation films. So for me, uh, watching that a kind of homage to the black exploitation film was really uh, powerful and, and fascinating. And, and, you know, so some of that is and that's a different character. That's the, the, the bad black man and mm. those black exploitation films comes out of a different tradition, a slightly different tradition than John Henry. It's the, uh, you know, the, uh, the John Hardy, it's the man who walks in and is willing to kill anybody who, who, uh, who looks the wrong way. And uh, that too, the, so the folklore part of me loved that movie uh, because I, I, I really appreciated the, the, the black exploitation films for all of their problems and, um, and the way in which they kind of repeat in a slightly different way these old black legends that go back to the 1860s and 1870s. You know, it makes me wonder, speaking of folklore and, you know, you're, the, the film comes out and everybody watches it. I remember I remember when it drops. It is it's very popular on Netflix at the time. I think there was the most streamed film or something. Along. I don't want to get your accolades wrong, so <laughs> forgive me if I don't have it specific. <laughs> but, you know, you got to give people their props or get your accolades right. Um, <laughs> but obviously part of that is the name, the title John Henry, right? Like, I think, look. We already said the Ballad of John Henry is one of the most uh, the most covered, most famous folk like uh, uh, songs, ballads in 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 history. Um, so there's something about the idea of John Henry that is universal. You know, it brings people in. Like, what do you all, you know, as as, as the creators, you know, Will and Doug, as the creators of this um, of this film that uses the John, Henry, like, what do you think is it is it about John Henry that drew people in, that draws people in, in and of itself? Um, well, I could say, uh, you know, legends are pretty universal. You know, there's a reason that, you know, tall tales and legends last forever, yeah, you know, going enough. back to the Greeks, going back. We're working on something about um, Goliath right now from David and Goliath. You know, and so it, you know, that the idea of these like larger than life, you know, characters of strength that, you know, are, are fighting for the good cause and things like that. Those those are, you know, um, universal and they and they always kind of they always kind of come. And, and, and live live forever and that oh that's something i've been drawn to with, with most of my work is like I, I like the idea of legend building you know i like the idea of you know taking something like and and the idea of taking what started as initially a small truth and where that goes you know because that you can take that back of, with everything is like if you take it, any legend like eventually if you go back far, far far enough there's a kernel of truth that started whatever that branched out to be you know from the greeks and the romans and and all that kind of stuff and, and a lot of time and when it turns into history people just kind of assume it's like we made up these stories to teach ourselves and, and stuff like that 
I think it's like we take store we take small things that are small piece of inspiration and then put things onto that. Um, so when it when it came to the film, that's like that was a that was a big source of inspiration to 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 get into John Henry. What do you think? Sure. Um, and plus, how many how many black folklores do everybody remember? I think this is the one that everybody remembers, you know, that this is the only one that I know of, you know, honestly, you know what I mean? Everything else is, well, I, I've heard it. Well, there's else. a so good old Nat Turner, Henry, but you know, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> we, got, we, we got, we got, we got a few, but some, yeah. are, some, are, some are less controversial than others, I suppose, you know, For sure, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I think this is the one that everybody, especially in our culture recognized. It was like, okay, John Henry, if they hadn't known the story, at least they, I know they've heard the name and they're like, well, let me, Take a look, take a gander, and see what it's about. We did get a little flack because they people assumed that it was going to be the actual story of the folklore, and where oh. you know some were good and some were like, oh, surprise, pleasantly surprised that it that it wasn't. It's more a little more modern. Did you get some pushback from people who were like, what? Why are you turning John Henry into a gangbanger who uh, who's out here murdering people oh. in the street? <laughs> we got that. We got the whole, and then definitely some slack about. There was no uh, closed caption for it. Well, the Spanish speaking, everyone was like, what are they saying? What are they saying? We don't know what they're saying, (laughs) you know. Um, But that's, you know, again, want to make it authentic as possible. You know, we didn't want to give that subtitle thing on there. You know, we thought it would mess up the film. But, yeah, we got some slack on why are you ruining a folklore? No one really kind of understood what we were doing. We we had to explain a couple of things. But, you know, overall, as you know, we, we were the number one film. So, obviously, people understood and they got it. You know, well, that does beg a question. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an, it's an interesting question, right? Because when we have, as you said, we have so few heroes, uh, in mm. especially of the black superhero variety, right? So, um, turning him into like giving his backstory one that's rooted in trauma, pain, and kind of the the gang life kind of thing, I can understand. I let me not say it. I, I can't say I understand. I love film. I'm I'm all for world building and all that other stuff. It doesn't that stuff doesn't bother me any way, shape, or form. It's all about how the story gets told. But I guess I can understand a little bit how some people who are very protective of the ability to maintain kind of a like we have so few. Why would we quote unquote add any negativity to what this person might have been in terms of uh, representation? Like this is a representation question, right? Like how are we representing who this person is now? Ultimately. Mm-hmm. I mean, like you said, this is a person who's out here fighting for good, right? Like he's he's made a change in his life and he's out here trying to rid the neighborhood of of not only his family, which there's a whole line of thought there. How sometimes you got to cut your own family out of your life and (laughs) sometimes you got to do it with a hammer and murder Mm -hmm. him in the middle of the street while little kids are watching. (laughs) But, um, you know, like, I guess for you and I don't mean to make this like you the representation of black America, but I'm the other black guy on the call, too, like. For representation oh. <laughs> purposes, listen, I'm one of the people that loves answering questions that white people have about black culture. Everybody can ask me the questions. If oh. there are any white people that have a question, feel free to ask me. I will answer all questions. Somebody got to do it. But like when you think of John Henry and the representation of black culture and then, like adding this film, the film that you all worked on and wrote and, and created into the canon, like how do you think this adds to the discussion about representation of, of like black legacy folklore characters? Well, is in order to overcome some, I feel you have to go through it. You can't, you can't overcome anything if you haven't been through it. And we want to try to relate to people could see that this is what's going on, but you don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. It's a choice. So if you're going through this and you want to come out of it, just come out of it. Start working on coming out of it. And like you said, sometimes we have to cut off family. We have to cut off friends. You know, we can't, we can't just dwell in that just for the sake of, oh, this is what we're used to. And we represent black people. This is, this is what's happening in the hood. This is what's happening down here. And you have to make a conscious choice of what you want to do. So we made this film to relate to this generation who are, who may be going through this and don't know how to get out of it, wants to get out of it, but don't know how, don't have the courage to get, or the capability of getting out of it. So we want to relate to them and show them that, listen, this is what you can do. You can simply just walk away and just be on a different path. Okay. I'm not trying to represent every black person in America because everyone has a different views on, Oh, I'm in the gang or I do this because I have to survive. And anybody can make that, make that statement. That's too broad of a statement. Like this is what I have to do. No, 
You don't have to do. What it is is you don't want to go through the struggle to get out of it. And this is what he had to go through. He had to turn away from his family, live with his pops, take care of his pops. This is what you have to do to get out of it, to get a better life. Don't just make an excuse and say, I'm going to stay doing this, stay trafficking, you know, kids, hooking, being a pimp to be cool or sell drugs or kill people just to say, this is what I have to do to survive. No, there are plenty of options on there, but you have to put in the work. It's just in whether it's emotionally or physically just working at McDonald's, working at a night job just to get by, then just keep struggling because our parents, our grandparents had to do it to get us to where we are right now. As two black men here, multiple degrees. At a certain time when our grandparents coming up, they couldn't get one, let alone two. You know, so this is what we want to represent to try to correlate between past and present. Okay. Back in the day, there were different kind of issues. This is our issue today. Yeah, I mean, you know that 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 begs the question of what you all hope, what you know, what you all hope people take away from the film. I mean, some films are just meant to be entertainment and you know, kind of bring a story. Mm-hmm. But we all put our own whatever we show up to the film with is what we tend to take out of it. We pull, we bring those things, we pull things from it. So, what do you all hope that people were able to take away or continue to as they watch, you know, as they continue to watch it. What do you all hope people take away from this film, you know, for conversation purposes, for cultural purposes, for, you know, just anything. What do you hope people get out of it? Yeah. Kind of piggybacking on, on what Doug was saying a little bit. Um, it's, and, and, and something else I, I had mentioned is like, when it comes to representation, um, the strongest form of representation the one there's a lot of it you know of, of different kinds it's like a world where like moonlight and medea come out at the same time you know that's a good thing you know and the and and being able to look at history and look at like through an objective lens rather than i feel i feel like especially the younger generation right now kind of looks at history as something to fix you know like we have to go back and change like redo all these mistakes of the past like fix it so nobody else has to go through that stuff um, and I think that's the wrong lesson. You need to learn from history, um, and see what happened in that, in that kind of sense, but you can't change what's happened in the past. So you have to, to, to look forward and move through it. The best way to do that is to look at everything. Um, so with this film, you know, we're, we're hoping everybody be entertained. Like, it, like I said, I'm coming from a, a background of, of, um, grindhouse movies that were, you know, kind of meant for, you know, go in, have fun, feel, feel good. Um, but at the end of the day, we also like take if we're going to have the opportunity to make a film, because what initially started um, this process was I had a horror film that was a separate movie that I pitched to some producers. Um, they weren't really into it. And I just had this idea. I was like, oh, I have an idea about John Henry. And they're like, oh, what's that? So like I, that kind of got the ball rolling. It initially started as kind of a simple home invasion movie because that's what they could afford and, and, and things like that. Um, but as the process was going along and it started to feel like this is going to be a real movie, I started to feel that responsibility of like, it needs to be more. It needs to, it can't just be, you know, a shoot 'em out John Wick kind of thing. It can't just be, it has to have some kind of more going on there. And that's what came with the trauma response and, and all those other kind of things and showing, you know, a guy like Terry and, you know, it's like, a you know, a strong black man who we've seen historically in movies, be the tough guy, you know, and, and everything, or be the goofy guy that, you know, he's, he's often felt that is like, he gets typecast as like the goofy black guy that white guys get to hang out with and stuff like that. Let him embrace his race, you know, embrace himself um, and his past and stuff. Cause he's had a lot of, you know, issues with his family, his father and, and things like that um, to give it a deeper level. And hopefully there's some kind of takeaway of, you know, seeing somebody like that struggle. You know, and seeing somebody like that struggle with his masculinity, struggle with, you know, his place in the world, his place in the world that he lives in. Um, we were also trying to, uh, you know, like we're commenting on the gang stuff. But we didn't want to get into the crip and blood of it because it's right. that's not that important. It's like the the whatever culture there is, like there's going to be if, if there's a lack of structure, there's always going to be something that comes in to fill that. And it's no it's never going to be good. You know, so it's always, there's always going to be some kind of gang or some kind of, you know, some kind of violent entity that's going to come in and try to take power in, in whatever situation that there's a power vacuum. Um, so we were trying to comment with hell, you know, he's, he's kind of the representation of that evil. You know, that's why he's, his name is hell. Like he's, he's, he's bigger than the gangs. Like he's like, he's, um, he's the, the physical manifestation of what the gangs represent to a certain extent is what, the, is what the intent is there. And when, when John is killing him, he's meant to be like, I'm putting a stake in the ground of this cycle of violence. Um, whether that, 
comes across. That's like that's up to interpretation. But that's that's what we, at least the intent we're looking for. So this is a little off track, but I was thinking about two other characters that are uh, traditional uh, black folklore characters that get uh, get reinterpreted again and again. One is Candyman. Right. Mm-hmm. Candyman mm-hmm. is a story that comes out of uh, the projects about, uh, you know, saying the name three times in the uh, in the in the window. But the other is uh, Br'er Rabbit, who becomes Bugs Bunny. Right. Mm-hmm. Who starts out as a black character who gets himself out of trouble by thinking fast. And this he again turns into uh, a white character. And so this uh, <laughs> people's obsession with you know being upset about uh, this black appropriation of white folklore characters is funny because in fact the two largest uh black folklore characters that we have are i think ultimately um black characters have been turned into white characters uh right. and reclaiming that uh black folklore tradition which is where most american culture comes from is uh is i think a, a really important uh Part of what what historians I think should be doing. This is not necessarily what filmmakers should be doing, but but mining those old stories about um, that are that you know the basis of the blues, place basis of all of that music is a, a really rich and complicated black folklore. I never thought of Breer Rabbit as being the precursor to Bugs Bunny. Um, I until you said that, and I see my parents made me watch Song of the South. I hated it. I hated seeing Uncle Remus walk around uh-huh. singing yep. zippity doo dah zippity. Oh, yeah. I hated that with my whole heart. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, <laughs> right. But I never even made that connection it's, until you just said that it never dawned on me. That's fascinating. Now, now I will never. And be... Uncle Remus is a white guy. Yeah, yeah. I will never go back now. <laughs> Sorry, oh, my Uncle Remus. Yeah, the story of Uncle Remus is a white guy who takes these black stories yes. and makes them more palatable to white audiences. But the original black so- stories that they're made out of are much right. darker and much uh, more complicated. And that's Br'er Rabbit. Yeah. He, you know, he gets into into mic- in a jam and he talks his way out and that's Bugs Bunny. But but eventually, you know, it's it's a it's a white guy who uh, is put in that place. And I think, you know, the, the, the strong man who represents the United States was until 1938. It was a black man and mm-hmm. largely the Communist Party who kind of put that image together and we whitewash it and turn it into, so, uh, yeah, I think, I think, uh, probably, uh, John Henry himself, the, the family, uh, should be make, claiming, uh, intellectual property credits for both Marvel and super, uh, and uh, DC, uh, shows and, and putting black characters, making a, an all black story, which is also, uh, fantastic. And uh, another thing I love about the film. So sorry. No, I, that's I perfect. And, off. You know, you all said something, you know, I think, well, you mentioned, you know, when you all, when you were presented with the opportunity, they, they passed on the first idea. But when you mentioned John, the John Henry idea, they were like, all right, what about that? And then while you're making it, you kind of got like, I guess what, what's the weight of making a film with the name John Henry? You know, like that seems like at some point, because you know that everybody's going to be paying attention, not just because there's a movie about gangland culture and a man taking over like you put john henry in there it care it becomes a different animal um but also you said that you all filmed like maybe half of the script what didn't make it that we you wish would have made it because i really want to (laughs) know what didn't make it that you all wish would have made it into like the final cut of this 92 minute film but start with the john henry the weight of john henry first please yeah that's like i said it's heavyweight you know it's um and it was something I took pretty seriously um, and to probably the detriment of the film, you know, because I was overthinking and trying to, you know, like, oh, I got to make this the most artistic version possible. And where you know, the simplest version in a lot of cases would probably be the, the easier way to go. But um, and because it was my first movie, too. So this is, you know, it, like we we wrote it together, but I had written a couple scripts, but I hadn't really. Ex- and I wasn't expecting to direct, direct it when I got the, the chance to direct it. It was just because it was part of the package deals, like the way that these kind of indies that are super small get made. Um, so it was like either my choice was either, you know, we make this, we make this movie the best we can make it, or there's no movie. And as, if there's no movie, then, you know, Terry doesn't get this opportunity. Like Ken doesn't get this opportunity. Like all these people, you know, that were, that were kind of counting on me to like, wouldn't have had opportunities both in front of and behind the camera. So it's like, I, I took that responsibility pretty heavy, both, um, in the casting, you know, in the, like, there was a lot of people they threw at me for, for John Henry that were not fits, you know, I don't want to name any names, but like, but like people that just like not, not the bill, either British or, you know, they were just like 
you know, there's just not, not the right kind of vibe. Um, and for a lot of the other roles too, where they just wanted a big name rather than, you know, somebody who's the correct, the correct character for it, especially the, the Spanish characters, the, the Honduran, um, they wanted that girl from Scream, Melissa Barrera, who just doesn't look at anything like kind of like what I, I'd imagine for the character. They tried to cast another big name, a list actress that, you know, didn't even speak Spanish and the whole role's in Spanish, but she was like, I'll learn, you know, it's like, I was like, I'm trying to get authenticity That's here. It's like, it's like, I'd rather go with an funny. unnamed, but yeah. yeah. So it's like, it was, and it was always a battle, you know, and, and usually one that like I would win, but just like by a yard. So it's, um, you know, I, I did my best from the position I was doing, but that was a, like, yeah, there's definitely a big responsibility. And when it comes to what we didn't get to film, all the action, you know, like a good, like, like 20 pages worth of action scenes that, that were pretty cool, um, that we couldn't pull off. Um, there's a lot of, you know, and just coverage, you know, just like the way, like the entire opening is shot. It's like, there's some scenes that are now two shots that we had, I think 15 planned and we just ran out of time. And there's like, there's no shoots, no, like no time, no money, all that kind of stuff effects, you know? Um, so it, it was a lot. And after the fact, like I was kind of under the, under the impression that maybe I get to do some reshoots or something like that. I had to basically go around with a little handy cam and, and, and try to figure and film the rest of the stuff myself for free. So a lot, a lot of that whole intro thing with, you know, Ken and everything that was all after the fact, just trying to fill in holes, you know, from things that we missed in, in the script and trying to be creative and try to find a way to, you know, get the best version of the story out there. So, so it makes sense for people so they can see all the, the work we were trying to do behind the scenes. The blood budget was very high. I gotta say the uh... it was it was it was tiny. It was like for versus that was the first thing ludicrous when we got him on board is our our squib budget went down the tank because like we originally had a lot of squibs mm-hmm. and uh, he needed a haircut and he needed you know special water you know and like all this little stuff and it's like and there and there goes all our, our all our blood. That's that's hilarious. There was, but we did have a lot in that one when we I was sprayed about to say, There was plenty. That was, that was, I did not yeah. feel like we were missing. <laughs> I did not feel yeah. like we were missing. I, I actually got I I got to do the spray on that. That was one of my favorite things I got to yeah, do. Yeah, it was like, it was an old Roundup, you know, like you use for uh for the garden. Like I just got I sprayed it with blood in the face. Yeah, when when yeah when he pulled the wood out of his neck and it was like I was like wow they that was. That was a lot. It's like, okay, all right. Yeah, and that was supposed to be this. From there on, it was supposed to be pretty hardcore, you know, very John Wicky from that point on. Right. And we just couldn't, like, they basically, as soon as I the budget came in, they're like, yeah, cut that scene, cut that. You can't do that. No, no, that's can't be like, <laughs> So, yeah, a lot of that. Got you. All right, well, the reason we, you know, the reason we've even convened this panel was to talk about John Henry. And this is based on, you know, the book that Scott wrote um, that I had the the opportunity to narrate, which was very informative for me. Um, and I guess kind of on a parting note, you know, what do you think, or why do you think it's important for people to learn the story of John Henry and to, you know, we'll start with you, Will and and Doug, to to learn the story of John Henry and like do research on who these, who he was, you know, whether it's because they're introduced through your movie and understanding, like even the significance, the significance of the hammer, you know, some people might not even understand what that is. They Mm -hmm. see a movie about John Henry, but you know. Why is it important for people to learn more about John Henry, you know, through audiobooks like this or the, the book in and of itself about, you know, Still Driving Man? Like, why is it important to learn about these these folklore heroes and legends? Yeah, I'll say um, for me, I like I, I think I mentioned before, I, there's a disconnect, I think, with this younger generation in history um, where even when they learn the way that they learn it is by just, they want to discover it themselves. So like they, if they'll watch a movie and find out about a character and then they'll go on TikTok for 10 hours and discover everything about it, or go on Wikipedia and discover everything about it, but they won't go to school and listen to their teacher. Who's already told you about this thing. You know what I mean? Like, so it, it's, it's a, it's a way, you know, if they and if that's the, all, if that's what it takes is like making a movie to get people to understand some shit, like, you know, it's like that. Like that's what it takes because it's like it, it's not getting through other ways. And if if the if that's all it did was like you know people watch the movie and they're like who the hell is John Henry and they look it up and they're like oh this is really cool, that's great. You know, even if they don't like the movie, that's that's then we did our job because that it gets it out there, gets more people talking about it, and you know it it, it goes on. Uh, uh, for me, I just think it's it's important because uh, we want to see more heroes that look like me. We want to we want to see more people that's doing things and can overcome adversities that, that look like me without having superpowers, just a regular person who just determination just overcame something, you know, it didn't end well for him in the folklore, but he did overcome it. He did win. So I think it's important that our youths have those heroes to reference and look upon instead of 
little yachty or whatever how whatever's going on right now you know i don't know half these entertainers right now you know so i think it's just positive strong black men as a good representation for us for them to look up to and model off of i happen to like little yachty by the way let me go ahead and little yachty i hope you listen to the audio book uh Go ahead and go ahead and get a get a couple bars off about John Henry. That would be awesome. <laughs> you know, so, um, right, right. No, that would be great. I would love to see Little Yachty's version. Oh of John Henry. man, somebody <laughs> make that phone call. Listen, I, I would, I would, I would pay money. I got to be honest. I might pay money for that. Um, <laughs> so, so I'll make another plug for folklore here too. In that. Uh, we don't think we think about rap battles as being uh, a 20th century thing, but they're actually they go back to the 1850s mm. uh, and rhymed insults that are traded between black men go back to the to slavery days uh, mm. in Mississippi, and Louisiana. And that uh, that story of the rhymed insults later called uh, the, the oh, dozens, dozens. Yeah. And, and then finally the becomes rap is uh, it's it's again, it's a really long tradition. And we forget how long that tradition is, that how long and deep that tradition is, that, you know, it's it's this African transplantation to the to the new world and, and the place where this gets, uh, you know, it's, it's not transmitted by uh, in a literary sense it's transmitted entirely orally. And that's the thing that's so exciting about uh, black folklore is that it's it, it's the 21st century manifestations of it are uh, have this long history. And I think when people start to notice that and think about it it makes it more it makes the history more attractive and it's not just a story about these are the bad things that we have to fix the next time i'm at thanksgiving and my cousins and i are joning which is our version of the dozens in atlanta <laughs> yeah. i will make sure to let them know we're standing on our ancestors shoulders so you better come correct with your, with your jokes because now if you let me down you're not only letting not not only are you just bad at this you're letting down the family and our ancestors so uh <laughs> <laughs> right they're listening they're right. waiting. <laughs> so scott you know what is you know I th i'm pretty sure i asked you this before when we, we did our original talk but you know why is it important for people to really dig into books like steel driving man john in the untold story of an american legend like why is it important to continue to pass down this information about these folklore about these legends and this folklore and all of this you know what is why is john henry still important which is a big question i realized yeah I, you know he is he's he's reinvented every generation is going to reinvent him and that's that's what's great about the film and that's what's great about other uh you know re reinterpretations of him that they, they, you can't just leave him where he was you can't just, and and understanding the context is important but also remaking john henry to address and to think about or to, to kind of live through what's going on in the in the present is absolutely uh useful and valuable and uh i said i suppose that you know, thinking about this from uh, let's let's imagine it from John Henry's perspective himself. He's a man who dies without children, who um, who rewrites the history of the South, whose uh, sacrifice goes uh, his sacrifice and the sacrifice of two hundred other black men who are digging that tunnel, who all die from silicosis. Um, that for them, the story about kind of carrying on that legacy is not to leave it where it is, but uh, to sort of see it uh, in the present, to sort of reinterpret it, to uh, retake uh, the, the uh, events as, as they appeared uh, and, and not get, just kind of leave them where they are, that they, um, I, when I wrote the book, uh, the, the story of mass incarceration was hardly a thing that historians studied. And now it's a, it's a huge thing. And thinking about John Henry in the context of mass incarceration uh, makes it a valuable and a really important uh, uh lesson and so i that's that's why i think that we have this black folklore that's the basis for most of our culture and we just need to find it again and and but rather than holding it in stone ossifying it uh we need to we need to recognize it and and continually reinterpret it uh, otherwise john henry just dies yeah. well, i'd like to thank you all for being a part of this conversation about john henry and pop culture uh you know will uh, Will and Douglas, Doug, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you know, and, and Scott, of course, like wouldn't be here without without your book to begin with. And it set me on an interesting journey and path to learning more about John Henry and just being fascinated by the story that I've always known, but apparently I didn't know it all. Um, so I appreciate you all being here. You know, Will, uh, Doug, what all do you what do you all have going on 
now? Any projects to plug? What, what, what's, what's going on in the world of, of, of Will and, and, and Doug? What, what y'all got going on? Yeah, we just uh, we just wrapped uh, our, our new movie, Name of the Game. Uh, it's a documentary about male exotic dancers in South Central LA and how that intersects with like the origins of hip hop, um, the gang culture, and kung fu assassins. <laughs> and we just we just won the the audience award at Mammoth Lakes Film Festival this year. Um, as pr- we're planning on putting it out this this winter. So the Ninja Assassins part is true. That's part of it too. Oh yeah, very true. Wow. But look, most of most of our our stories come from our friends that have these undercover lives. <laughs> from like I was telling you about John Henry to this documentary that we're doing, Name of the Game. We've been knowing him for years, years, and years. And these poker nights that I have, they bring out all these stories, and and it's just uh, it's it's crazy how we just like wait, go run that back. What did you used to do? And now looking at them now, and you know they got the dad bods and all this other stuff. Like, what <laughs> used to do what? <laughs> and and then, and then the doors once the door is open, it yeah, just goes it was wild, a floodgate. You know? So we just we had to get it on film. Yeah, and and the idea too of like you know coming off of John Henry, you know we like people were wanting something similar than that. And we like we just felt like like it was stronger put when we put a camera on our, a lot of these people that are in John in, in name of the game were in John Henry too. Mm-hmm. Like they were they either had small parts or cameos or, or, or things like that. But so, like, even like we were talking about Tommy, the big guy that's, that's in the beginning of John Henry, like he's the funniest guy in oh, America. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. like it's, it's pretty hands down. Like I know, I know a lot of comedians and this guy trances all of them. And the point of putting him in John Henry is to try and give him a little shine so he could be, but he's acting for the first time. He doesn't really know what he's doing in name of the game. We just put a camera on him and he just goes, and it's like, and, and it, you get to see the reality of like, like how funny and how charismatic and how interesting all these guys are. Was he a ninja assassin? No. no. Okay. Whether or not he was a whether or not he was a dancer is up for debate. But uh... <laughs> you see your you see your reaction when you said was he an assassin because how big he is. So imagine six of those guys big like that saying, "Oh, we used to dance <laughs> in a G string yeah. with tassels." Oh. Okay, it's hilarious. And, it can, and, and like got got started with the you know the same like the same way NWA got started in the same club that NWA, like the boom, boom room or, or studio East is mm-hmm. where these guys danced back in the day. So it's a lot of intersecting, mm-hmm. intersecting lives. Well, that certainly explains the outfits of the world-class wrecking crew. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, Scott, what, what tell Alonzo you, you said that <laughs> <laughs> Scott, what do you have going on? I know what, what, what new projects, what new book are you working on now? You just had, you just had a book drop. Yeah. Um, right. So I got this project on drugs, uh, history of uh, the the drugs that make the Caribbean possible: coffee, sugar, tobacco, cocoa. But uh, the this other project that I m- might might be working on is uh, on wastewater. It's not does not sound like the sexiest topic, but uh, where black people settled immediately after the Civil War was a place called the Bottoms in most s- southern cities, mm-hmm. the areas that were the swampiest uh, and least attractive parts of those places. And water is still a serious problem in those areas. And um, infant mortality is very high in those areas, even still. Uh, there are lots of black people in southern cities, uh, particularly with uh, the, in the in these areas where lots of water flows that um, don't have proper sewage and don't have proper water. Uh, so the Flint story, but all throughout the South. So I'm interested in uh, sort of telling that story using uh, a lot of map information and uh, working with an ecologist and a geographer and a public health person to kind of think about these black bottoms. You've, you've heard about these towns, places called Bronzeville mm-hmm. or the bottoms or the mm-hmm. black bottom. That's where black people resettled immediately after the civil war. And those are the unhealthiest places in the South uh, then. And they're the unhealthiest places in the South today. And it's not because there are black people there. It's because um, the wastewater is all runs from the cities right down into those areas. So it's a it's a kind of tragic public health problem that's that needs to be solved. Fascinating. I look forward to look forward to checking that out. I'm I'm very uh, black bottoms and bottoms. Is, they're always the setting of so many stories set in the early 19th century and late right. 1800s and 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 all. So that I've never knew where that where that title came from, but I've, it's everywhere from Memphis to New Orleans. Yep. Uh, Atlanta to every every city right. with black people has a black bottoms. Detroit, like all these cities have a black bottoms. So 
Uh, it's fascinating. I look for I look for, I look forward to that. Um, but while we're here, uh, you know, thank you all for being here and everybody listening. Make sure you check out Steel Driving Man, John Henry, the Untold Story of American Legend. Shouts out to our guests Will Forbes, Doug Skinner, and Scott Nelson for this fascinating conversation about John Henry and pop culture. Shouts out to Will and Doug for their film John Henry. Uh, which is available right now on it's on Amazon. Uh, I'm not sure if it's on streaming everywhere, yes, it is. but I definitely saw it on Amazon. Yep. I very much look forward to the name of the game. You had me at Ninja Assassins, but the rest of it also sounds fascinating. <laughs> but anything <laughs> Ninja Assassins typically is going to get my attention. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Special thanks to the team at Marginal Media Works who produced the audiobook: Sanjay Sharma, Milan Chakraborty, Brian Aguilar, and Sterling Shore. Uh, so thank you everybody for for listening to this conversation about John Henry and make sure you check out all the works by all of our fascinating panelists and guests here uh, for this discussion. I'm Panama Jackson. Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.